When she called me at that moment, I didn't ask her, how did it happen? What's, what clogged the toilet? In reality, it didn't matter at that moment. What mattered is that she felt taken care of in that time of stress. And, and because of that, we had her for another year and a half, and then she actually filled our unit with one of her friends. So that's another thing that you got to think about is as you're taking care of these renters is, is vacancy is real. Vacancy happens all the time. But if, if somebody loves living in their space, their friends and family love being there too. And so they're probably going to fill that unit for you, and it, it, you don't lose a whole month's worth of rent by doing it. It is a common saying amongst real estate investors that you make money when you buy, not when you sell. While this catchy phrase has value, it fails to convey how easy it is to lose money through poor property management. Whether you self-manage or hire a professional, it is important to understand how to navigate the common pitfalls and challenges with rental properties without losing your shirt or your mind. That's why you have tuned in to Maximizing Your Property Value, the apartment owner's guide to operating rental properties as a successful business. I'm your host, John Stiles, real estate agent and team leader of the VIP Real Estate Group at Bridge Realty. As a current multifamily investor and former property manager myself, I understand the headaches and difficulties of keeping an investment property from becoming a money pit and time sucker. It takes a solid business plan, it takes tested systems, and it takes key team members to actually find success. So let's take a deep dive and maximize your property value. Welcome back, everybody, to another edition of Maximizing Your Property Value. This is the show where we dive into best practices for managing your rental properties so you can be successful. And today I am pleased to have with me Scott Hofler, who is with uh, Side by Side Realty. He's actually the owner and realtor there. Mm -hmm. Also, Scott's a real estate investor. So, Scott, thanks so much for coming and taking time out of your day to be in studio with us today. Yeah, John, thanks for having me here. Wonderful. Scott, so why don't you give us a little bit of your backstory of how you got into real estate investing? Great. I love this story. Uh, real estate investing has always been something that I think Drew and I have, Drew, my twin brother and partner, has thought about since we were younger. Um, I remember my dad walking us around our neighborhood blocks when we were in Chicago, showing us homes, and he was a studied architect. So we just, we liked houses, we liked properties in general. Um, graduated from college with a ton of student debt, decided, hey, this rental thing, paying rent, paying for our living expense, this is expensive. So let's buy a single family home in South Minneapolis. And we're like, cool, we'll rent out some rooms to our buddies, uh, we'll pay for our mortgage, we'll get to live together, and it'll be great. And um, as we were looking for a, a property in South Minneapolis, my dad goes, hey, you guys should buy a two flat. And we're like, dad, what's a two flat? And that's uh, what they call duplexes in Chicago. And we're like, no, 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 Dad, we're not landlords. But then the more we looked at it, we realized, hey, this could be a real thing. And so we, uh, we looked at a duplex in uh, an up-and-coming area called Northeast Minneapolis and bought that one um, and rented out one side and lived in the other and had our rent and mortgage covered. So it, w it worked out really well. All right, wonderful. So tell us now about the transition from your first purchase to where you are today and what that looks like. Okay. So that first purchase went so well. We were living for mortgage free, living on one side, renting out the other. And we're like, okay, this, this is working really well. Let's buy one property a year from here on out. And why? We didn't know. We just thought it was a pretty cool idea. And so we got to that following year and actually life kind of took off and real estate seemed to be hard I was climbing the ladder in my corporate job. I was doing really well. I had met my wife now, Jenny. We were dating. We were, our life was taking off. And I turned to Drew and I'm like, I, I, don't, I think I'm done with this real estate thing. And my twin brother, partner, goes, no, that wasn't the agreement. You were going to buy, well, I was going to buy one. You were going to buy one and we were going to grow this thing. And I was like, sorry, Drew, I don't have time. And then that day I went for a walk with my dog and there is an episode on Bigger Pockets that I listened to, and it was a gal named Bree from Chicago. And she had left her corporate job, really stressful sales job, because she had passive income coming from rentals. And after that 45-minute talk, podcast much similar to this, 
I was all in. I said, Drew, let's go. And so the next year we bought a, a duplex in Northeast Minneapolis. Um, it was $140,000 and we rented both units out for eight fifty. dollars So those numbers worked for us. Um, and so today, let's fast forward a little bit. And I think this is kind of the main point of the conversation is that at that time, we didn't really know why we were buying real estate. We didn't have a plan of action. We were just going to buy one a year and see how it goes. I actually remember somebody I, re- I really, really respect hearing that plan. And he goes, you're going to buy one a year from here on out? It's like, that's the stupidest idea I ever heard. I'm like, <laughs> whoa. I'm like, this is a guy I really respect. He has a great family. He's doing really well in life. And he thinks my idea is super stupid. And I think that's what goes to show you that not everybody's going to believe in your plans and your dreams. Um, and at that point, um, even though I was taken aback, Drew and I uh, looked at each other and were like, how do we grow this thing? Something's working here. We're getting passive income. We're living for free. Um, uh, a mentor of ours, Kim Burke, that we both know, challenged us. She's like, you need to think bigger. And that's where our brain started to spin. It's like, how do we take this hobby, this, this idea that we have right now, and turn it into a business? Um, and that's the year that we decided, okay, we're going to go from real estate being a hobby to real estate being a business. And in that year, we bought five properties. Um, and plenty of people buy more properties in a year than, than five. But for us, like that was a, a fundamental uh, pivotal change for us. Hmm. Yeah. Well, let's talk briefly about how did you make that? Um, how did you make that work for? I mean, just the down payment alone, and and getting qualified for those five different mortgages or whatnot, or you know, how did that work for you? Yeah. So when we first started purchasing properties, we leveraged the power of owner occupied financing. So cash is king. So limited cash out of pocket. So our first duplex was. 5% down. Our second duplex was a great program, 3% down. Um, again, limiting the cash out of pocket. And as you're starting to make connections in the real estate world, you're starting to talk to different lenders, different investors. You kind of build, and they talk about it in bigger pockets, that, that tool belt. And you start dropping new tools in your tool belt, and those new tools were different financing options. And so in that finally, following year, we still had some more owner-occupied financing. So my wife before we got married, bought a duplex because she could before we got, we moved in together. Um, and so that she was able to buy another owner occupied property, but we did a contract for deed. Uh, we used the Burr method, which a lot of people talk about in the investor world, which it's buy, renovate, refinance, repeat. Um, and so that was a great way to get into a property. So you, you start building, it's, it's your, it's, it's your investor IQ and you start gaining knowledge about financial programs and products and start leveraging them so you can buy more real estate. Yeah. So what does your rental portfolio look like today? Our rental portfolio looks like, so when we made that shift from a hobby to an actual business, we sat down, okay, what does it mean to be live financially free in lifestyle life and freedom to have choice over your lifestyle? And so we just said, okay, if we had 22 properties, would be financially free. And so at that moment, we decided, okay, we're going to buy 22 properties by the time we're 32. And we were 28 at the time. So we had a lot of work to do ahead of ourselves. Um, and so right now we're sitting at 15 properties, not quite to 22, and we have 28 units. Okay. And so even though that was a really big goal at first, 22 by the time we're 32, but now that we're falling a little bit short, it's still much better than where we would have been if we didn't set that goal to begin with. Yeah. Wonderful. It's good to have goals, right? Yes, it is. That gives you something to shoot for. For sure. So let's talk about this business planning. Um, what is what does business planning look like for you when it comes to your rental properties? So business planning for rental properties, uh, we read a great book called Traction, and that helped us think, okay, get our mindset around real estate is a business. So let's start looking like it, looking at it like a business. And I think it, like any business that you start or any goal that you have is you have to create a why around why you do what you do every single day. So why are we investing in real estate? What do we want it to help us achieve? And for me, my time is my most valuable asset. And for me, real estate equals time. And I think if I can create that time margin in my life, that's where I'm starting to achieve the things I've always wanted to achieve. Um, and so for building a business plan is how do we get there? Who are our partners? And that's not even partners within our own company, but referral partners and industry partners, people that you can leverage that are experts in your field, that are 
beyond where you can be in that area of focus and and ask them questions and build a relationship with them and and become their confident in some ways and they become your confident in other ways. So understand who's around you and who's in your network that can help you push your business model forward. Um, another thing that we we really focus on that I think the landlords of our past lost track of is your renters. And your renters are your most important piece to your puzzle. And if you build a great relationship with your renters, if you instill some ownership into your renters who are living in your properties, who are making memories in your properties, who who are bringing their baby home for the first time in that property, who are who are having small group with their girlfriends over some wine and creating memories. And I think if those people start believing the place that they rent is also their home and they want to take care of it, you're going to have a great relationship. And I think oftentimes people who are landlords think, okay, it's a privilege for my renter to live in my property, which is totally untrue. It's actually a privilege for you to have that renter choose your space to live in because they're the ones paying your mortgage. They're the ones that are that are that are keeping that property in your portfolio because without them, you're going to lose it to the bank. So I think for, when you're creating a business plan around real estate, your renters and tenants have to be a part of that business plan because they're your customer. Yeah, that's huge. That is a huge difference from the way some people think. Uh, just what you said that all these tenants should be grateful that I give them a place to live. Um, you know, that that attitude is not going to get you very far with that relationship. For sure. For sure. Bad landlords have a bad rep for good reason because there's a lot of bad landlords out there who think that, who have that mentality and it's incredibly wrong. Mm -hmm. So you've talked about having team members. What are some of the team members that have you, you have put into place? For sure. So the first one would be my twin brother and business partner and um, and I think together we help each other think bigger. I uh, think bigger about his capabilities and my capabilities. So um, that partnership has been wonderful. My wife, Jenny, and her support and love, I feel like I can walk on water when I'm around her. So it's been a, an amazing um, person to have in my life. But outside of that is, who are your industry partners? So I mentioned before, Kim Burke is crucial in helping me understand the financial world. Um, about three years ago, I was looking for a career change because going from real estate as a hobby to real estate full time, one way to do that is shift your career focus. And so my career focus became on real estate uh, and I joined Kim Burke and her team at Leader One uh, because they were fo their main goal was to help people buy uh, multifamily property. I buy multifamily property. It was a great fit. But she's definitely one of my industry partners that, uh, that I think because of her her encouragement, her support, her leadership, and then on top of that is just her knowledge about the business I've been able to absorb and learning it from the financial side. Uh, there's other, and that's where people, you start to see is like, just because they're not part of your company doesn't mean they're not a partner of yours. Um, you, John Styles, it's like there's people around you that you come in contact year over year that are doing business the right way for the right reasons, absorb a lot of what they're doing, absorb the way they talk to their clients, absorb the way they talk to you, and then eventually it'll start overflowing in, into your relationships and your contacts. Um, commercial lenders, um, insurance agents, uh, property managers. One of my favorite partners is Garrett Gordon of Renters Warehouse, and his knowledge of leasing and his go get em attitude has been a, a, a really cool benefit to have on our team. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about that uh, property management relationship. Sure. Um, do you guys uh, do a lot of management in house, or do you hire that out to a third party, like Renters Warehouse, like you mentioned? Yeah, we we manage all of our properties ourselves. Uh, it's been our main goal since the beginning to do that, and I would argue that most early investors should start managing properties themselves, at least for the first couple of years, so that they start getting a feel what it's like to manage properties, how to screen tenants, how to do basic maintenance. Um, and then once you do that, if you go to hire a property manager, you know what makes a good property manager because you've done it. Mm -hmm. You've done it yourself. And so you can start shooting holes into somebody who is not really taking care of your renters the way they should. Um, the reason why we take care of our properties still is because we still have that mindset around taking care of our renters. And for me, I haven't met a property manager or somebody who has that same type of care for our renters. And it's maybe because I'm the one that owns the building. And so I'm very protective over, over my renters. And to 
make sure they're they're living a great life in in the property that I own. Um, I do have relationships with property managers, and I think they're in, super invaluable, especially if you're trying to scale a business. And I believe that once you get to about ten units, managing themselves, managing those units yourself becomes very difficult, almost impossible. So you have to make a choice: is do I go into real estate full time and manage them myself, or do I start hiring out? And I think that's the ten property or ten unit um, is kind of your cap. Sure. Yeah. So then when it comes to leasing, do you also do that or do you hire that out? Leasing as well. Management, leasing, all the works we, we, we do manage ourselves. Um, okay. We have been uh, blessed with having Garrett on our team and he does is part owner of a lot of properties that we own. Okay. So he does a lot of the leasing and placement of, of tenants. And because of his experience with Renters Warehouse, um, he has a, a really great background to be able to do that. Nice. Yeah. yeah, it's great to pull on people's strengths and expertise there. For sure. Der- Garrett calls me the paper guy. So yeah. I manage all of our finances and all of our bookkeeping and stuff. So he's got the cooler job than I do. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay. And then, so as you have kind of developed this management process internally, what have been some systems or workflows or processes that you've set up to really help you be efficient and effective? So if there's one piece of um, growth area that I could have, it would be processes. And when you're just out of the gates, you're kind of a gunslinger as you're trying to get stuff done as fast and the way you know how. But as you start building properties, it's important to build out processes. And if you don't, if you're moving too fast, those processes don't get built. And then you basically have some false footing. And so eventually, as you add properties and add renters, there will be mistakes made because you don't have the processes put in place. Um, I would say one of the best processes we have is a software called Cozy.com or Cozy.co. It's a basic free app that you can manage all your properties. There's another local company called Zendler that does similar work too. Actually, they're probably better than Cozy, but I got started with Cozy, so it's hard to switch now. But um, it allows you to put all of your properties under one software and rent collection, work order requests, um, capturing leases and keeping them over time. So there's, if you can have a process where you get most of your paperwork, your communication, your activity around your properties into one space, that would be the best suggestion. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, uh, there's other ways you can do things by paper. I mean, back in the day before computers, you had paper leases and whatnot, but you can be so much more efficient if it's all in one place and you have different reminders within the software or what has been some of the key features that you've liked about Cozy? Uh, Electronic payment. So when you're acquiring a property, you're probably acquiring renters who pay by check. Landlords walk around, knock on doors and collect rent checks. And that's just how they used to do it back in the day. But if you can get your renters to a point where they're paying you through an electronic payment system, through Cozy or Zenlord or any of the property management software that you use. Um, even if you don't use a property management software, Venmo, uh, PayPal, there's so many electronic payment options out there that keep the paper check exchange to a minimum. Um, and that's where you get hung up. A lot of renters want to send their check by mail and who knows if you ever get them. Yeah. Uh, and another thing about processes and the biggest thing is your time. Like, we're not investing in real estate to be able to have it take up more of our time. So finding ways to cut that out and to do do the things that you're trying to achieve with less amount of time. Um, so when you're screening tenants and you're holding holding showings, is be in control of those showing times. Don't allow tenants and renters and potential renters to control when you're going to show that property. Block out time. Saturday from 2 to 5. We're going to do an open house kind of thing, and we're going to run as many renters through as possible to see the property. And that, again, saves you time going back and forth to the property when people want to see it. Yeah. Well, that's right there is a good example of a process to mm. uh, control the time and control the how the experience is there. For sure. You've already talked about this a little bit, but uh, when it comes to tenants, how do you make sure that they're having a great customer experience at your properties? For sure. Uh, Tenant customer experience is not oftentimes an important piece to somebody's business plan when they're managing rental properties. When your tenant's happy, they're 
there for a long time. They're, you're having lower vacancies. So it's very profitable to make sure your tenants are, are feeling great. One of the things is that we allow our dogs. And so when you're, when you're marketing your property and you are pet friendly, there's a lot of good pet owners out there who can't find good rentals. And if you allow for pets, cats, dogs, majority of the time, you're, you're going to have access to a bigger audience of possible renters that you wouldn't have otherwise. Um, and so making sure, and to, to do that is a lot of people, and it feels weird talking about pets as much as we do, but I think it's just important because people oftentimes they see their pet as an extension to their family. And so if one of the number one renter demographics today is the millennial, and there's a lot of millennials who are getting pets and waiting to settle down in their relationships and waiting to have kids. So they see their pets as a part of their family. Um, and for us is we don't charge a pet deposit. We market at a really nice rent. And so we build that into the rent. But in general is if you're, if you're charging for a pet deposit, you're basically saying your extended member of your family, you need to pay for them to be in that house. And so it's, it creates a, a different connotation around allowing their pet to live there is they have to basically pay for their, their pet or their family member to live there. Sure. Um, Before you go on, uh, let's just talk briefly. I think a lot of landlords are concerned about letting pets into the property because of damage that has been done or stories they've heard. So how do you balance, uh, you know, allowing that and yet making sure your property is taken care of? For sure. The, one of them is a breed of dog. So a lot of times there's the bully breed. So make sure you're talking with your insurance coverage and, and seeing what type of pets they allow or they don't allow under your insurance coverage. So if that pet does bite somebody, you're liable for it. And so ensuring that you have the property insured properly. Um, but sometimes they don't allow pit bulls within their coverage. So know your coverage and know what your insurance company will allow. Um, you screen the pets like you do the tenant. So if you do know dogs, on that first meeting, have the tenant bring their dog along, meet the dog, play with it, get a feel for if it's well-trained or if it's not well-trained, talk with the owner to see about what they're, they're doing to train the dog. So build, build that relationship around the tenant and their, their pet as well. And so you have a pretty good idea if it's a, it's a good pet or not. And on top of that is in the five years that we've owned, six years now that we've owned rental properties and have allowed dogs, I think in total, we might have had $1,100 worth of damage for 28 units. So dogs don't cause as much damage as you really think that is. And then people are very good about owning. If, they own, if they're a good dog owner or pet owner, they will own up to the fact that their dog might have destroyed something and they will reach out and ask to pay for it. And I've had that happen multiple times. Okay, very good. Hey everybody, I'm interrupting the show quick because I wanted to invite you to a special event that I'm hosting at the end of 2019. You know, the end of the year during the holidays is a great time to be getting together with friends and family, making new memories and even new traditions. One new tradition that my family started a few years ago is volunteering at Feed My Starving Children. If you haven't heard of this organization, you should definitely check out their website. It's fmsc.org. Basically, they utilize volunteers to pack nutritious meals, and then they send those meals overseas to different areas of the world that have a significant need for food. These meals have made a huge impact in thousands of people's lives. And I really like volunteering with Feed My Starving Children for two main reasons. Number one, it gives you a tangible way to give back. It's not just giving money, which of course is important, but it allows you to use your time and your energy alongside of other people in a common cause. And number two, it fosters discussion of how we can live our lives serving others and not just be focused on ourselves. And since this is a family-friendly event, it allows us to live out this mindset right along with our children. So would you consider joining me? I've reserved 50 spots, and this is room for you, a friend, a loved one, to join with us and help out the cause. It would be really amazing to see you there. The date, time, and location is in the show notes. There's also a link that allows you to sign up and let us know that you're going to be there. And you can share that link with other people that you think might be interested. So thanks so much for considering it. Now, let's get back to the show. 
Well, let's get back to that conversation about uh, customer experience. Is there anything else that you do to maybe uh, create kind of a community at the property or just uh, really make it have an environment where they like to come home to? Great. I love that question. Uh, community is, let's, let's backtrack a little bit, is if you're going to own or occupy a property, live in one unit, rent out the other, there's a really unique experience that you can create by creating community in that in that duplex itself. So your lit one, our first duplex that we moved into, the upstairs units, uh, tenants became some of our best friends. Um, you're sharing the yard together. You're sharing experiences. If you're sitting on your front porch drinking coffee and they're heading out to work, you're having conversations with them. So if you're if you're somebody who craves community, buying a duplex is a pretty nice way to have it. Um, and on top of that is when my renters move in, I give them a little note and a six pack of beer in their fridge so that they feel welcomed to that property. So immediately they know, okay, I'm around. I'm taking care of care of them. Um, on top of that. When I do meet them at the property, we do a video walkthrough to make sure the property is in good condition and we're on the same page of what needs to be fixed or replaced. Um, and on top of that, I'm asking questions about their life. And there's, I have a large network in Minneapolis, and oftentimes I've had a chance of get, helping that person find a new job. Or one gal was looking for a dog, and I was able to connect them with a pet that I knew of somebody that was giving away a, away a dog. So if as you're building relationships with those tenants, you start seeing them as different as than just somebody who's paying your rent check. They're actually real people that you can help. And um, yeah. Yeah. Those are some great examples. What would you say to people that kind of approach their rentals as, I don't want anything to do with my tenants. I don't want them to know who I am. You know, you seem to be having kind of the opposite approach to that. I would say that's a mistake. Uh, I think as you're getting larger, it's harder and harder to build a relationship with every tenant, but you're in, it's a, it's a people business and you're not having rental property unless people were renting from that property. So I think building a relationship with them is really your competitive advantage as a good landlord and eventually a profitable landlord. Nice. Very good. Let's talk about maintenance and capital improvements. Sure. Um, first of all, um, how have you gone about finding good repair people? Do you have any uh, people that you've brought onto your team as employees, or you just hired third-party maintenance people? Uh, we hire out third-party maintenance people. And uh, Garrett Gordon has a really cool trick about this. If you're 10 feet away from somebody, talk with them, ask them questions. So he is often standing in Home Depot, and he sees a contractor, and he'll just walk up and start having a conversation with them. So we find a lot of handymen and contractors just by reaching out and, and talking with them um, when we do see them. And I think it's been the biggest challenge for us, and I think that's going to be the challenge going forward for real estate, really is the trades and people who know how to swing a hammer and know how to do simple plumbing tasks and, and remodeling work. And I think the more that our next generations are pushed to go to this four-year university and get a degree, the more people are going to be shying away from the, the trade work. And I think there's a huge opportunity for people to go into the trades. Um, there's a lot of work to be had. It's very difficult to find good subs and good contractors today just because there's so such a finite amount of them and they're strapped thin. There's so much work out there for them. And so I think if there's there's a if there's a problem or a concern that, that I have about real estate ownership in the future, it would be about the the demand for for trades okay yeah so that's a great technique about meeting yeah. contractors um what about vetting them to make sure that they're qualified to do the work and uh you know that also they're going to give you good pricing so that's a challenge i think um the, really the only way to vet them is to have them work on a job and you can call and get referrals from people you know but that person might have a great experience with a contractor and then you go to hire them and you just found the week that they were strapped and they were working an 80 hour week, um, they're having issues at home and they, you don't get that great of experience. So really the one way to do it is to have them do a job. Um, start with a smaller job if you're looking to hire somebody for, for bigger stuff and if they, can, if they can handle that smaller job then you can probably guarantee that they'll do a good job for you in the future. Um, and then when you do have a good contractor, a lot of people think shopping around, finding the best price is the best way to go. We experienced that in a negative way in the fact that we were trying to hit a budget and we kept shopping around looking for a cheaper price. 
but the reality of good contractors are, are, are a little more expensive for good reason, is you get what you paid for. So I wouldn't as much think about how do I shop to find the cheapest contractor, is how do I shop around to find the best contractor. And what I mean about that is somebody who you can tell is going to treat you well, good, good communication, that's a big one too, if you text them and they respond to you in a, in a ready manner, um, that's important too, to know that they're, they're they're doing their job and they're doing a good job. Yep. Yep. Okay. Wonderful. Um, now, is there any ways that you've found to keep track of what type of materials, you know, whether it be the appliances or the flooring or the paint colors so that in the future, when you need to make repairs or do a turnover, that it's kind of a more efficient process. Um, have you found any things that are useful for that? So that's an area of improvement. Um, like I said, when you're running a million miles an hour to try to hit your goals and buy properties, there's some processes that you give up and knowing what paint color you use at a certain property, what kind of appliances you put in there, um, whether you bought new for that unit or you used A1 used appliances, you just, you kind of lose track of that. So that's where I say find a, a property software, uh, management software that you can keep track of that stuff in and, and be diligent up front because if you try to do it later on, it gets harder and harder like anything. So if, you, if you're diligent about the way you uh, keep track of what's in your units and who's there and, and uh, right away out of the gates, then you're gonna continue to do it and make good habits doing it. Yeah. Um, but I would say there's a lot of property software that allow you to keep track of that stuff and I would, I would use them. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I just know for myself when I'm doing turnovers at my units, um, it's always like, well, what paint did I use yeah. here? What sheen was it? And I'm looking back at some of the the paint cans that are half full down in the basement, like, why did I pick that paint? You know? Yeah, <laughs> I would say don't get too cute. Find a color that you think majority of renters are going to like and reuse it and reuse it and reuse it. Drew and I argue about it all the time. He hates gray. I love gray. I think most people love gray. And so we use, we use a paint, and you can steal this too. It's called Sculpture Clay by Bear. It's a Home Depot product, and we love the color, and we've had a lot of success with it. Um, so yeah, pick something that works and reuse it. If you're doing remodels and you like a certain countertop from Ikea, you know how they cut, you know how to install them, pick a certain product and keep reusing it. Yeah. And as you guys have done either turnovers or major renovations, what things have you selected to just, in keeping in mind, you know, is this going to be attractive to a tenant? Great question. I think a lot of people get hung up with um, over-renovating. Um, and I think as you're looking at a property from a homeowner, it's different than what a renter might look at a property. And there's details about your the property and the unit that a renter's going to care about, and there's other details that they just don't care about. So spending the money on them is not going to get you a return on your money. Uh, and there's tips and tricks. The more you do rentals, the more you learn what those are. And I think to renovate and to update a space to attract to a renter, making sure it's clean. And a lot of times people are like, okay, i got to rush this, the, the old renter out and the new renter in, and they fail to really deep clean the property. And, and smells are a big one too. And so every time I do a turnover, if I feel like there might be a need for a paint job, do a paint job because it cuts down on the smells immensely and it cleans up the place. Fantastic. So uh, paint, flooring... Um, they don't much care about what kind of flooring as long as it's laid nicely. If, there's, if, if the kitchen has separation in some of the, the floorboards and you think you need to put new LVL in, do it. It's a really easy fix and upgrade. So flooring, paint, and then cabinets. Is, cabinets get a lot of wear and tear and use over time. So making sure those cleans are, clean, are clean and updated. And if you have to paint cabinets, paint cabinets because it's what uh, renters care about as well. Hmm. Yeah. That keeping them clean is really important, and yep. and that's a low cost way to Super. attract good tenants. Super, it's a it's small things that you can do to make a, a unit look homey and, and ready to go, and and keeping it deep cleaned. And if you and I'll, and don't bank on the renters' past security deposit to do that cleaning. Do that cleaning either way. Yep. Um, and I think oftentimes we get hung up as somebody needs to pay for this if I'm going to do it. For the unit and that's not true it's your responsibility as a landlord to present a great unit whether you're going to be able to pull from somebody's security deposit to do it or not it's still your responsibility to to create that space 
Yeah. Yeah, that's huge. Just preparing it for that next tenant so that they can have a good experience, regardless of what happened at the last one. Regardless. Yeah. Just don't use your past experience with the old renter as what you think the new renter is going to give you. Yep. Yeah. Wonderful. And I'm not sure what your philosophy is with uh, how long you plan to hold these properties, but do you keep in mind that you know you might sell these properties one day and, and as as you're doing these different maintenance things, capital improvements, and um, yeah, how does that how does one day it being for sale affect how you maintain it? That's a great question. We don't have the future sale in mind. All of our mortgages, most of them are on 30 year fixed, so we intend of holding them long term because we do want to create that kind of passive income for us. And we did find a nice little niche in the marketplace that we really enjoy. And these are small, approachable investment properties that we can use conventional financing to purchase. Um, a big thing for me is appreciation. And so we do leverage the equity in our properties. And one way of leveraging that equity is maintaining that property so that when an appraiser does walk in, the condition of the property reflects what other market properties are looking at. And so that you can get the value back so that you can pull a, a HELOC or a line of credit um, or do a cash out refi. So it, for us, I think it's mostly maintaining the equity in our property so that we can leverage that into further, further properties. Yeah, that's huge. I mean, like you said, even if you're not going to sell it, if you're going to have an appraiser come through, mm -hmm. you know, the condition of the property will reflect on the value. For sure. So it's really important to keep that in mind. And the condition of the property reflects on the condition of the renter. And so if you have good properties that are in good condition, you're going to have great renters that love it for long term. Yep. Yeah. Well, I think that you've been in the business long enough where you probably have experienced some difficulty with being a landlord. Mm -hmm. Yes yeah, or no? For sure. Um, so maybe tell us one of the challenges you've experienced and maybe something that makes you pull your hair out about, you know, what am I doing in this business? I think one of the challenges is that the more I'm using rental property to give back time to myself, my family, um, the more you, rental properties require you to just be on. So I have a love-hate relationship with my phone and I would love to just turn it off, disconnect and leave it to the side. But in reality, because I, I have... I'm responsible for homes that people live in. I have to keep it nearby. Um, and so that that is a challenge, is the more I try to get disconnected, I have to stay connected in that way. Uh, and then on top of that is, is maintenance calls are real. Uh, plumbing issues are real. But you go through seasons. So it almost feels like when it rains, it pours. Is this, this property will have a plumbing issue. This property will be... Be, be doing a turnover and I'll be marketing for new renters. And then all of a sudden for two months, I won't hear about anything with any of our units. And I think it's like understanding that when you're in those seasons, there's, there's, a, there's a calm after that storm. Uh, and you're not always going to be in that season. You're just, it's just a part of uh, the game that you're playing, being in a real estate investor. And on top of that is discerning who's responsible for issues when they arise. So we had one instance where I had a, a renter give me a call and she sounded frantic and she say, says, and I'm going to swear, but she stands and says, I'm standing in a pile of shit and it's not mine. And immediately I said, okay, hold on one second, hung up the phone, called the local hotel, got her a confirmation number for her roommates and her dog to go spend the evening in while I took care of the, the problem. When she called me at that moment, I didn't ask her, how did it happen? What's what clogged the toilet? In reality, it didn't matter at that moment. What mattered is that she felt taken care of in that time of stress. And and because of that, we had her for another year and a half. And then she actually filled our unit with one of her friends. So that's another thing that you got to think about is as you're taking care of these renters is is vacancy is real. Vacancy happens all the time. But if if somebody loves living in their space, their friends and family love being there, too. And so they're probably going to fill that unit for you, and it, it, you don't you use a, lose a whole month's worth of rent by doing it. Yeah. Well, that's a huge uh, loss to your income if for you sure. do have a vacancy. For sure. So any way you can cut down on that, it's great. And that giving her a bad taste in her mouth from that experience would have probably caused her to not want to re-rent with me for another year and have somebody move in. So by me having her pay for that problem that might have happened because of her, I would have lost out on so much other money. Yeah, good point. So flipping that coin on the other side, uh, what has been the best benefit of being a landlord? 
there's a there's a really cool level of pride that you get when you do own properties and somebody and you're providing the home to somebody else and I think that that's just a ton of feel goods that happen that go along with that especially somebody who wants to resign and love to resign with you for for another another year um, so I've I've really enjoyed that I've also really enjoyed the connections that you make in real estate people like you John that are in it for the right reasons that are taking care of people. And I think there's a level of, of, of I met somebody a couple of weeks ago that his number one goal is to human, humanize real estate. So in the, in, when you're talking with the city, a lot of the, a lot of times they want to put properties and rental properties into this box. Like it has to have certain things to it, but people occupy spaces for multiple different reasons. And I think it's it's remembering that real estate has that people approach, that humanized approach. And so being able to build relationships with not only your renters, but other industry professionals has been probably one of the, my favorite things of being in this business. Nice. If I said that properly. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah, it is a people business. I mean, especially now as it's going more and more to technology and, yeah. and there's different businesses that are trying to displace Real estate agents, uh, property managers, uh, you know, different things in this space. So to have an approach that's uh, recognizing the humanity and the, the people that we're dealing with is really important. Yeah, it's an emotional business, and to to forget about that as we're trying to scale business and and improve on our technologies would is it would would be a mistake. Yeah. Nice. Well, I want to ask you about where you think the rental market is going. Mm. Now, I'm not expecting you to be an economist, but just based on your experience with how long it takes to lease up a property um, lately, um, do you feel that uh, the trajectory we've been going in, which is just rents going way up, is going to continue? Or are we going to see that drop off here soon? Like, because we're all worried about, you know, when is the shoe going to drop and we're yeah. all going to be worried, you know? I think uh, everybody is looking for a crystal ball and try to speculate what the market will be and get rich up of speculation. And I don't think that's where we need to go. We need to understand that there are market dynamics that are happening. And if you're going to think about Twin Cities from a local market, is the Twin Cities is strong. And I think the rental market is still very strong. People are moving to town. We don't have a population flight going on. We have a population uh, increase. And so every, every year or two, we're getting... What, there's arguably, I don't even know if the numbers are right, about 80,000 people that move into town. That's a new Maple Grove every one to two years. So if you're looking at it from, from a trajectory of how well is our local market going to do, and it's going to continue to do well, people need to live places. And so if you're a landlord who are providing those places for people to live in, you're probably in a good place. Um, and, and in return, is there, we're not building new homes and new properties fast enough to accommodate the population growth. So if you're somebody who does hold a rental property and the growth is happening and we're not providing any new places for them, for those people to live in, you're, you're, you're in a good spot. Yeah. Well, I, uh, we are building some, but not nearly enough. We are building. And everybody, you, you look around and you think, okay, there's so many cranes going on and there's, there's a lot of these mixed use, um, lower level retail, five floors up of rental property happening. And you think they're happening everywhere, but it's still not fast enough. And on top of that, those are more of your high end rentals that are, that are happening. So there's, 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 a, there's a missing middle. There's a, there's a affordable housing crisis happening. And um, I think where, where if you're a smaller investor is you can fill that niche pretty nicely. Yeah, yeah, very good. If, if you recognize that where your property fits in, is it A class, is it B class, is it C class? Because most of what's being built is your high-end A class. For sure. Because that's what's affordable to build For sure. in that space. For sure. So, you know, that's great that those new units are coming on, but they may or may not affect your particular property. Definitely. So... Wonderful. So let's just go back to that topic of business planning. Anything else about business planning for rental properties that you would just kind of highlight based on your experience? Um, business planning for rental property, like I said, is having your why locked in and in place so that you can overcome a lot of the obstacles because real estate comes with challenges. It comes with a lot of challenges. And if you don't have some other bigger reason for why you're actually investing in real estate, it's going to burn you out. Um, we call it uh, investor amnesia. So when something happens and it sucks and it ruins your week because you spent so much time fixing it, and then that following week you no longer have the issue because you fixed it, 
and you barely remember it because you're now pursuing more rental property, we call that investor amnesia. So having that built in your business plan is pretty nice. Um, but I think oftentimes we have to look at our short term to see how we get to our long term goals. And we're always looking at, okay, that person has it better. That person has more more things going for him. He's He's got more experience. Um, she's got more money. As we always point to other people who are doing things that we want to do. But I think we all have our unique skill sets and challenges or and and advantages in this marketplace. And I think we need to do a good one eighty and look at ourselves and figure out okay, what what is our skill set? What are we good at? Is it networking? Is it building relationships? Is it are we analytical? Are we really good at running numbers and and cash flowing spreadsheets? Are we are we great at podcasts? And if we want to get more exposure to the business, let's run a podcast that allows us to get more exposure to the business. So there's like, like there's things that we're good at. And if we're looking at other people and saying they have things that, that we don't have and that's the reason why they're successful, we're going to lose that way. Um, and it, it took me many, many years to figure that out, probably until I joined Kim's team and she reminded me of the skills that I was good at and to leverage those. And so in your business plan, I think you need to understand, okay, what are you good at? Focus on those deploy the rest of it to other people. Yeah. Well, that I think that's huge. I, I think that's a great way to be wrapping things up here. We all as humans tend to try, tend to compare ourselves to other people and feel that we're less than. For sure. Because um, so-and-so is doing so much better. But yeah, it's a good reminder. What are we good at and how can we excel at those things? So For sure. That's really important. For sure. Wonderful, Scott. Well, I appreciate all the insights you've added here today. Before I let you go, I want to just ask some more uh, questions about yourself. Give the audience kind of an insight to who is Scott. So, Scott, tell me, why do you get up in the morning? <laughs> oh, yes. Well, right now, my morning looks like 2 a.m. in the evening because I have a, a, a newborn. And so he's a month old, and he doesn't really know what morning or, or nighttime <laughs> is, which has been fun. That means I get a lot of baby, baby snuggles in the middle of the evening. So I would say that's the reason why I get up today. Um, outside of that is we talk a lot about why you do what you do every single day. And I have a burning desire to help other people. I think my time is my most valuable asset, and I wanted to use it to give it back to the world. And so if, if I'm not waking up in the morning with that fire in me, there's a lot of people that probably are going unhelped um, because of it. So I think there's it, it that feels high level, that feels floofy, but when that bleeds into what everything you do, whether it be business, whether it be personal growth, uh, my faith is a huge piece of who I am. And I think that if that starts bleeding into other areas of your life, um, getting out of bed is just going to be exciting every day, even if you have a newborn. <laughs> Nice. And congratulations on that. Thanks a lot. Um, so tell me briefly about who is a person or what was an event in your history that was significant to changing who you are today? That was a, that's a big question. Um, immediately off the top of my head, because it's helped me solidify who I am. So my twin brother is a, a very important to me. Um, and he did a, sorry, <laughs> He, uh, he did my best man speech at our wedding. And up until then, I was like, I do things intentionally, consistently for a reason, but I didn't really ever know why, and I'm going to get to that in a second. But he gave this speech that was super incredibly funny. Um, and then halfway through it, he, he starts degrading himself and saying, Scott's smarter than me. Scott's always pushing me to be better. And he turns to me and he goes, but the thing about Scott is he never thinks he's better than you. He's never in front of you. He never, he never is trying to lift you up because he's already there. He's always beside you with his hand on your lower back, pushing you along. And I think for me, that was a crucial time in turning my mindset to know, like, God put me on this world to help people become the best version of themselves. And with my twin brother, who's been alongside me for 28 years up to that point, letting me know like that's what I'm good at. Now I'm trying to have that be in everything that I do, is that I want to help other people become the best version of themselves. Um, 
And I think that for me was crucial to watch somebody I respect so much stand in front of 300 of our family and friends and say, that's the best thing about me. Nice. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's great. Uh, you have such a close uh, family member as a, as a twin. Yeah, so, for sure. Um, very sure. good. Thanks for sharing that. Well, um, you know, if anybody wants to learn more about your philosophy on rental properties or just, you know, you're a real estate agent here in the Twin Cities, you know, get a hold of you for that purpose. Uh, what's the best way that they can reach out to you? Uh, we have a website called SideBySideRE.com. SideBySideRE is in real estate.com. You can also find me at email, Scott at SideBySideRE.com. Or I'm really good with text. So if you want to text me, it's my Chicago number at 773-318-2989. And you'll find that on our website as well. Very good. Well, before you go, I want to give you the official Maximizing Your Property Value mug. Sweet. And I want to ask you quick, are you more likely to put coffee or hot chocolate in there? Coffee. Okay. Uh, for sure, coffee. And then at 4 o'clock, maybe beer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. All right, Scott, thank you so much for your time here today. Yeah, John, you've been great. Thank you. The opinions shared on this show are for informational purposes only and should not be taken as a solicitation for representation or investment in any specific offering. Please consult with your financial, legal, tax, and real estate advisor before making any investment decisions. John Stiles is a licensed Minnesota real estate agent with Bridge Realty. Thanks for tuning in to Maximizing Your Property Value, the apartment owner's guide to operating rental properties as a successful business. If you're considering scaling up, downsizing or right-sizing your real estate investment portfolio, it's important to know how to determine your property's value in today's market. That's why I've put together a free ebook for you called How to Calculate Your Investment Property's Value. To get your copy, go to www.realestatestyles.com forward slash value. Now, if you found any value in today's show, be sure to subscribe to our email newsletter, YouTube channel, and podcast through your favorite podcast player. All the links are in the show notes. And would you do me a big favor? Help me get the word out about this show by sharing with your friends on Facebook and LinkedIn. And lastly, we appreciate your five-star rating on iTunes. I really appreciate you and wish you the best in your real estate investing career. Signing off, I'm John Stiles with Bridge Realty. Make it a great day.